please be advised that if you would not like to be seen or heard on the internet, you can adjust your, your uh, camera and microphone settings accordingly. Join me in a blessing for study. Baruch ata Anonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshanu b'mitzvotav, vitzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. And off we go. Um, I got my copy of the, uh, the Koran Pirkei Avot, which uh, just came in the mail. I, I ordered it online and, uh, and it's great. Um, this is the um, Koran Publishing House is known for doing it right. They have recently published an entire Babylonian Talmud, which after about six years of incremental publication, I finally have collected all 42 volumes. Um, that's at the office. This is a very slim volume, as you can see. Um, beautifully laid out, really easy to, to read. It has the Hebrew and the English. Um, the Hebrew translation is by the late great Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who died just uh, the other week. And so we're still in Shloshim for Rabbi Sachs. And the commentary is by Mark Angel, and it's lovely. And it's really, really good. So uh, this is a great traditional edition. I also gave you the new edition, which Jewish Lights Publishing, I believe, has produced of the uh, Pirkei Avot, a social justice commentary by my friend and colleague, Rabbi Shmuley Yankowitz, Yanklowitz, um, who's a modern Orthodox rabbi, but whose pluralistic and progressive outlook often puts him into conversation with his reform and conservative movement colleagues as well. So I sent those links out in the, um, in, uh, the weekly mailing last week and uh, the email that comes from Natalie's desk. So uh, it, this is just one of those books where you don't need to have an entire Mishnah on every Jewish bookshelf at home, but you really do need to have a Pirkei Avot. So, um, so get thyself a Pirkei Avot and that way you might find it enjoyable to, to study along uh, in print because I recognize that staring into a computer screen is not really what the rabbis of old had in mind. Um, with the way these texts would be encountered. But also thank God for Safaria. Um, so I'm gonna put up on screen um, a little bit of what we are uh, looking at today. Um, we are in chapter one of Pirkei Avot. Avot, in case you just missed it last week, is uh, one of the tractates of the Mishnah that is distinct among all of the tractates of Mishnah in that it really doesn't cover the uh, halachic domain. It's not really a tractate that covers matters of Jewish law, though peripherally at times it will. Its main thrust is in the sphere of the ethical. Avot is really a master text in the Jewish tradition on what a life well lived looks like. Um, and uh, I think that becomes clear by the time you get to the Mishnayot that we're reading today. Um, so we, we read Mishnayot numbers one and two last time with a, a fairly substantial preamble. If you missed it and would like to get a little bit more grounding in Pirkei Avot, just go back to the video link um, that Natalie sent um, of last week's class or my YouTube channel. You can just... You, Google YouTube Rabbi Jonathan Blake and you'll find my YouTube channel. And then all of our classes are actually still online um, and available for public viewing. Um, we talked a lot last week about the rabbinic project and it's clear that shoring up their own authority as the legitimate purveyors of this thing called the Jewish tradition seems to be a primary objective of the rabbis who are writing and codifying the Mishnah. And if you keep in mind that that's really what the rabbis are doing, they are actually creating and recreating rabbinic Judaism uh, and therefore need to establish themselves as the authorities and arbiters of Jewish law and tradition, that will help the way in which you understand the, the text before us. Um, the first uh, text is indeed about transmission itself. So it's kind of a meta commentary on the very subject about which I'm speaking. Um, and it proposes a direct line of transmission of Jewish tradition from Moses through Joshua, the elders, prophets, 
and the men of the great assembly, even as we saw last week, though, at least in the case of, for instance, the prophets and the prophets of the men of the great assembly, there's no other evidence in the Bible that the transmission of the Jewish tradition went that way. In other words, there's no explicit references other than the poignant passage in which Moses hand commissions Joshua, ordains him with his hands on his shoulders and bestows upon him what is called Moses's uh, ruach, a little bit of Moses's spirit or inspiration, gives it to Joshua and then Joshua automatically becomes the kind of living embodiment of whatever Moses was carrying in his authority to lead the Jewish community. So there is a direct transmission from Moses to Joshua about what you can read in the Torah and Bible itself. But after Joshua, there's no passage where you can, for instance, see Joshua convening the elders and saying, here's the Torah, take it. If you read the last chapter of Joshua, you might conclude that that's what's going on in Joshua 24. But in other words, this is more about the rabbinic imagination retrojecting into the story that comes before them a chain of authority that happens in a very direct linear way, literally a chain, from Moses to Joshua to the elders to the prophets to the men of the great assembly. And as was pointed last out last week, the prophets seem to be anything but traditionalists. Whereas the prophets don't seem to get their message from their predecessors or from a scholarly class that came before them, nor do the prophets seem in any organized way to take a body of Jewish wisdom and then transmit it wholesale to the next generation. The whole idea being like, um, I guess the opposite of a game of telephone, though, I, you know, the game of telephone where you whisper something in the next person's ear and by the time it comes around the table, it comes back to you. Only usually what makes the game of telephone fun for kids is that what was originally spoken to the person to one's right or left is not what comes back after a chain of five or six or 10 or 20 different transmissions. It's, it always gets warped. The rabbis are actually suggesting that nothing was lost, nothing was warped. So that was one of the themes we covered last week. The other theme we covered quite extensively was how these texts set up a dialectic between the written law and the oral law, uh, the written Torah and the oral Torah. Again, go back to last week if you missed it or need a refresh. Um, we read about Shimon HaTzadik, Simon the Righteous, who said that the world stands upon three things, the Torah, the temple service, and the practice of acts of piety, or more famously, the way it is framed in the Hebrew, Al HaTorah, the Al HaAvodah, the Al Gimilud Chasadim. The full text, um, Al Shlosha Devarim HaOlam Omed, the world stands on three things, Al HaTorah, on the Torah, Al HaAvodah, on temple service, or worship, or spirituality, or work, or servitude, many different valences to the word avodah, the al gimilut chasadim, acts of love and charity, or practice of acts of piety. Um, and that's where we stopped. So now we're going to meet a guy with a really curious name. Um, you can see here in Hebrew, Antigonos, or Antigonos, um, Ish Soho. So this is a guy named Antigonus, a man of Soho. Um, these people are not yet called rabbis because what the rabbis are doing here in the Mishnah is filling in the gaps between the Maccabean revolt. So let's say the Maccabean dynasty is inaugurated in the year 167 BCE. That's what historians generally agree to be the date of the Maccabean conquest um, where the Maccabees prevailed over the uh, the puppet st state of the Greek Empire in what is present day Syria. We sometimes call them the Syrian Greeks. I don't think that's a particularly helpful definition because we think of Syrians and Greeks today and it has nothing to do with those uh, national ethnic groupings. Uh, Syrian Greeks are better called the Seleucids or the Seleucid Empire. It was a family or a, a dynasty that was again, set up as a puppet, puppet governing regime in the territory that is present day Syria by the, by the Greeks following the conquest of Alexander in 333 BCE, Greek or what we call Hellenistic influence held sway over much of this region in the ancient Near East. Um, and so the Seleucids are the dynasty that the Greeks set up to manage the territory in the North uh, modern day Syria. 
and the Ptolemies, P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, the Ptolemies uh, are the uh, fake pharaohs, the Greek puppet state that is set up in what is, uh, what is and was Egypt. Um, so you have these two kind of sub empires, both deeply influenced by uh, Hel Hellenism, by Greek uh, civilization and culture. Um, and the Maccabees, of course, are a band of zealous Jews, think like Taliban Jews, religious, Jewish religious fanatics who take up arms against the Seleucids and particularly against the oppressive policies and practices of their ruler at the time, Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus IV. Um, so I say all of this by way of both setting the stage for when these texts were, or these sayings may have originally been spoken. Uh, they're being compiled, of course, many, uh, many years, if not centuries afterward. Um, and here we have a guy with a distinctively Greek sounding name, Antigonus, um, from a place called Soho. He received, it just says Antigonus Ish Soho, which means Antigonus, the man from Soho, Kibel, the Hebrew word for to receive, like Kabbalah or Kabbalat Shabbat. Kabbalat Shabbat means to greet the Sabbath or to welcome Shabbat. So Kibel is the past tense form of the same verb, Likabel, which means to receive or take in. Kibel Mishimon Hatzadik. So Antigonus, the man of Soho, received from Simon the Righteous, who's the guy in the text right above, right? Shimon HaTzadik is the guy who said, Al Shlosha Devarim HaOlam Omed, the world stands on three things, Torah, Avodah, and Gimilud Chasanim. And immediately we have this guy named Antigonus who receives from Shimon HaTzadik, meaning he receives the tradition, receives the oral law, the oral Torah from his predecessor. So even though Mishnah number one gives us a five-fold chain of transmission. The transmission doesn't end in Mishnah number one, right? After Moses, Joshua, elders, prophets, men of the great assembly, that's the first five, it's clear that there's a direct connection to Shimon HaTzadik, who it says was Mishayare, uh, sorry, Mishiyare Knesset Hagadola. He was one of the remnants or the last remaining members of the great assembly which as I explained to you last time is generally believed to be or associated with the returning leadership of the Jewish community after the Babylonian exile under the administration of the governor Nehemiah um, and his scribe Ezra, both of whom have names of Bible, biblical books for them, have biblical books named for them. Uh, so you've got these men of the great assembly concurrent with Ezra and Nehemiah. So we're talking, fifth century BCE. And now we're um, uh, including a guy, oh, I seem to have frozen. Hello. Shoot. Hi. Did we freeze for a little bit there? Are we okay? Can you hear me now? I got a notice while I was expatiating at quite some length that my internet connection is unstable. So I switched routers. Um, how, how are we now? How does this connection seem? Now it's fine. Okay, what did, where was I? <laughs> we learned that Wi-Fi is the fourth leg of the stool. <laughs> right. You were in 500 BCE. Okay, good. Um, so we're getting from the men of the great assembly, which includes a guy named Shimon HaTzadik. He transmits to a guy named Antigonus. And already you can just hear from the name that Hellenistic influence ought to be considered as part of what's happening in the community of the Jewish people at the time. That, that's all I really wanted to say. I understand that you're still having trouble hearing me. Are, are we good? Thumbs up if we're good. <laughs> okay, good. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, some things just are out of my control. Um, but I'll keep an eye on the, 
Yeah, what year is Simon on the scene? I don't know. Somebody Google Shimon Atzadik. Actually, one of the nice features of the the Koran Yavot is that it lists all of these folks. Um, in the beginning, there's a list of sages mentioned in Pirkei Avot. Um, and uh, the, uh, it says that the sages quoted in Pirkei Avot may be divided into five general groupings. The first group includes those who flourished prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. So that's a long list of names, by the way. This whole list of names, which includes Simon HaTzadik, Antigonus of Soho, Yossi ben Yoezer, Yossi ben Yochanan, Yehoshua ben Parachia. These names I don't expect you to know. A couple names I do expect you to know. They include, um, they include Hillel and Shammai. Um, so Hillel and Shammai are part of this group, but the group, this is 250 years of Jewish history, right? So this group includes um, Hillel and Shammai and all of these folks spanning from about 167 BCE up to the year 70. Um, so Simon Atzadik is somewhere during the Maccabean period or after, um, but I'm not sure if somebody wants to look it up and find it, that would be absolutely fantastic. Okay, let's bring some text back up onto the screen. Um, so uh, Antigonus of Soho received the oral tradition from Shimon Atzadik. He used to say, here's the actual teaching, do not be like servants who serve the master in the expectation of receiving a reward, but be like servants who serve the master without the expectation of receiving a, a reward and let the fear of heaven be upon you. So notice that these guys often speak in, in these kind of neat brackets of three. These are intended to be, I believe, mnemonics that would allow the disciples easily to memorize these teachings. Um, so in Hebrew, he says, Al ha shemashim et harav. Do not be like those servants who serve the master, though it's a very deliberate word choice here. The word for um, master is um, rav, which also means teacher. So do not be like those servants who serve their rav, their rabbi or their teacher, their master. Al menat lekabel pras simply in order to, there's that word again, le cabel, to receive a pras, which by the way is related to the English word prize. Um, you might've heard of the preeminent uh, award for a citizen of Israel is the uh, Pras Yisrael, the Israel prize, same word. So don't just serve the master in order to receive a pras, Ella, rather, hevuch avadim, be like those servants hamishamashim et Harav, who served their master, Shelo Almanat Lekabel Pras, not in order, oopsie, to receive a pras, a prize, Vihiyu Morashamayim Alechem, and Vihi rather Morashamayim Alechem, and let the fear of heaven be upon you. So, what is, what is being taught here? What are the rabbis trying to, to get at? And, and why does this come early in the text, by the way? In other words, why is this in chapter one? Not only, it's not just chronological because it's attributed to Shimon Sadiq. I think that what's being articulated here in chapter one are general precepts, ideas that are going to inform the rest of the, the text, the rest of Pirkei Avot. So what, what is this, do not be like servants who serve the master in expectation of receiving reward, rather be like servants who serve their master without the expectation of receiving reward and let the fear of heaven be upon you. How do these ideas connect? What do they try and convey? They're just trying to set the table on why you're studying. Good. So for, for the pureness of it, not, not getting a diploma. Thank you. Right. So the, the value here is actually given a name in Jewish tradition. It's called Torah Lishma. It literally means Torah for its own sake from Shem. Shem is a name right? You probably, it's one of those few words you might have picked up in Hebrew school. You have to, at the very top of the page, it says Shem, and then you write your name next to Shem. Um, Torah li Shema means Torah for its own name, or Torah for the sake of Torah. You don't study Torah in order to become wealthy, or famous, or a big shot, um, despite what you may have already conjectured about my motivations. Um, the, the purpose of studying Torah is to 
is its own reward, right? So, and, and, and secondly, I would say, um, and that's why the term for the master is deliberately ambiguous here, it's Rav. Remember that the people who are being, for whom this text is written, who are studying it, are rabbis in training. So this is a, a discipline of learning transmitted by rabbis to their next generation of disciples who will rise up and become the teachers of the Jewish community. And I think they want to uh, make it clear that, look, there are two reasons why one should pursue a life of Jewish piety. One is you do it out of love, and the other is you do it out of fear. And these are both important motivators, right? And they're both good motivators. You should serve God out of pure love. And that's why you don't do it for the sake of a reward. You can't bribe somebody. You can't make it so attractive in material terms to become a rabbi. Otherwise, I think that the, I would conjecture that what, what's on the line is the purity of the tradition itself, that it would be corrupting. It would taint Judaism to have rabbis go into the biz simply for the sake of reward or recognition. You should love Torah so much that it's, it is its own reward. But secondly, do this also out of the fear of God. Okay, that's what I... Judy, what were you going to say? That's what I wanted to ask. To me, it implies some kind of a spiritual uh, addition to this. And I had mentioned before that, the, and you said God is really not mentioned here, but, but that the, the divine has to be part of this formula. Um, of the fear, and I have the fear of heaven in my, I just uh, got the other um, Pirkeo vote. Um, so, and, and anyway, that's just to add that spiritual element uh, beyond the mundane, beyond the day-to-day, -day, beyond the, the right. back and forth of human beings. Right, so so the, can, absolutely, Judy. So the, and, and, and again, having different translations will be illuminating because it will give you a more dimensional understanding of the text if you can look at multiple translations and then make your own best assumption that the real, the real meaning is somewhere in between or blending uh, all different translations. I love reading in multiple translations because they all contribute to an understanding of a text. Um, in this case, I think it is both veneration of God, fear of heaven is almost always a stand in for God. Yeah. So there are really two good reasons to go into the rabbinate, according to the rabbis, who are, of course, the authorities, one, love of Torah, and two, fear of God, or veneration, rever reverence for God, and love on the one hand, and fear on the other hand, make a very comprehensive motivational set for one who is entering this world of complete submission to the study of the law. Right. That's what it's going to require of these pupils. And that's also why I think this comes early in the Mishnah, early in Pirkei Avot, because we're really talking about, I, I visualize a rabbinic academy where, or a pre-rabbinic academy, where the teachers were basically saying to their disciples, here are the reasons you do this, right? In other words, they want people who not just know a lot of Torah, but people who are in it for the right reasons. And I think I mentioned either last week or the previous that um, up until the 19th century, the rabbinate was not a paying job, right? You, you didn't make any money being a rabbi. That's why Rashi made his keep as a vintner. He was a winemaker. Um, and most rabbis throughout history had other jobs. On Yom Kippur, I talked about another one of this pre-temple uh, destruction cohort, this first generation of sages who the rabbis are uh, uh, listing in Pirkei Avot chapter 1. I talked about a guy named Shimon ben Shetach. Um, if you were present online for my Yom Kippur remor remarks, I'll refresh your memory. If you weren't, I'll tell you for the first time. Shimon ben Shetach, in the first line of the story that I told, we learn is a flax trader. He is in the cotton business and he's struggling. That's the first thing we learn. that although that's how he makes his keep, he's not doing very well. And his pupils want him to have more time to teach Torah. So they propose that they will buy him a donkey. And that's what they do. So they buy him a donkey. The rest of the story is what I focused on on Yom Kippur. It turns out they bring home this donkey. They find in the saddlebag that the donkey has around its neck a precious jewel. Turns out they bought the donkey from a Gentile who didn't know that there was a jewel. So that's, that's what I talked about in Yom Kippur. But I would highlight just the first line of that, that teaching from the Jerusalem Talmud, from the Talmud Yerushalmi. 
is that we learned that Shimon ben Shetach was a teacher of Torah who had to make a living. And he was a cotton trader. He was a flax trader. Um, and uh, his disciples were actually, they felt cheated. They felt impoverished that their teacher was spending all of his time trading in uh, the cotton business instead of teaching Torah. So they wanted to make it possible for him to teach more Torah. And that's throughout, throughout most of history been the dilemma for most rabbis. When am I going to have enough time to teach Torah when I have all of these other things I need to do to make a living? By the way, it's not that different for me. Uh, just reflecting on this personally, uh, I often lament that I, I'm really cut out to teach and study Torah. And if that were all that my job were, I think that, you know, I, I would have fewer headaches. <laughs> but being a congregational rabbi of a large, bustling, thriving congregation is a lot more than teaching Torah. Then you, you just try to teach Torah in everything you do. Okay. Any thoughts or questions on the teaching from Antigonus of Soho? Alrighty then, let's move on. Um, lots of crazy names here. I would give this up for public reading, but but I don't want us to get stuck on the, the name. So, Yossi ben Yoezer, uh, Ish Tzreda. And that's why they say a man of Tzreda. It's a little bit of an awkward uh, syntax. It doesn't translate very well. In Hebrew, it says Yossi ben Yoezer, Ish Tzreda. I would just say Yossi ben Yoezer, the guy from Tzreda, the Yossi ben Yochanan, Ish Yerushalayim, and Yossi ben Yochanan, a guy from Jerusalem, Kiblu Mehem. They received it, meaning the oral tradition, from them. Who are the them? Presumably Antigonus of Soho and Shimon the Righteous. So it's like this recursive line of transmission where every time, it's sort of like a uh, the song I know an old lady or the chant I know an old lady who swallowed a fly. Each verse has an additional layer or had gadya or those songs that so now Yossi Ben Yuezer of Tsereda and Yossi Ben Yochanan of Jerusalem received the tradition from Shimon Hatzadik and Antigonus of Soho. And you already can see here the tendency for the rabbis to attribute their sources. I when I teach uh, Mishnah and Talmud to my teenage students, I always use it as an object lesson in citing your sources. Um, kids these days actually uh, have a very hard time plagiarizing. Uh, this was a problem about 10 years ago. There was so much quote unquote free material on the internet um, where kids could just basically take somebody else's stuff, pass it off as their own, kids and adults, by the way, take other people's writing, pass it off as their own and never get caught. These days, there's a website that teachers can plug a student's paper into. So if a child, if a student submits a paper online, which is how students submit their work, not even during the pandemic, but in general, the teacher runs it into a website and the website can find, find out whether or not it is likely to have been plagiarized. So kids these days, as opposed to 10 years ago, know that they can't get away with plagiarism. Nevertheless, there's something to be said for um, not just evading the, uh, the internet censors, but also what is good ethical practice, which is cite your sources. Um, so Yossi Ben Yoezer used to say, let thy house, I have no idea why we're using the antiquated thy here. We haven't thus far in this translation. So that seems a weird choice on the part of the Safaria translators, but let your house be a house of meeting for the sages and sit in the very dust of their feet and drink in their words with thirst. And the word for sit in the dust of their feet is wonderful. It says, Veheve mit abek be'afar raglehem. Literally get yourself dirty in the dust of their feet. It doesn't actually say sit. The word mit abek is a word that means cover yourself in ash or roll down in the dirt. Be'afar raglehem, in the dust of their feet. And drink in their words with thirst. So what's happening here? What's this text all about? What's the, um, what's, what, what do you take away from this text here? Go for it, Dad. I see your hand up. 
It seems to be talking about the uh, the kavana of how you're to approach study rather than the keva. Great. Okay. So good. This isn't just about what you are studying. This is no, about how. Right, the act of study and how you should approach it. And notice again, it's a threefold instruction, uh, kind of the three way or threefold mnemonic. Three things I'm going to tell you. The world stands on three things Al Hatorah, Al Havada, Al Gimilut Chasadim. Antigonus of Soho says three things don't study for a, in the hope of a reward, do study without the hope of a reward, and let the fear of heaven be upon you. And now Yossi ben Yoezer also teaches a three-way teaching. Let your house be a house of meeting for the sages, sit in the dust of their feet, drink in their words with thirst. And I can visualize a scenario in the ancient yeshiva where these teachers would then quiz their students and they were expected to memorize all of this. They, they weren't like passing out pieces of parchment with the text written on it. This was all communicated orally, presumably. Um, of course, eventually it does become written literature in the time of the Mishnah, but the, the rabbis, I believe, are drawing on a wealth of teachings that they were forced to memorize when they were young. And again, look at what matters to the rabbis. For if you're going to choose this path of study, then your home should be open and a gathering place for the sages, and your job as a young pupil is to sit and absorb it all and drink in their words with thirst. So I think it is a statement of kavana. It's also a statement of kavod, right? It's a statement of the respect and honor that the student is required to give to the master or the masters, plural. And in that way, what's being set up here is a continuation of the dynamic from text number one, right? This is all about how is Torah transmitted? Right, we know that the Torah tells us that God gave the Torah to Moses at Sinai. That was revelation. But I think what's happening if you keep reading is a sense that the rabbis feel a personal and professional sense of responsibility to keep the revelation going. And the way in which you do that in Judaism is you cultivate a circle of disciples. And even as much as you as a rabbi are responsible for teaching your disciples, disciples are responsible for welcoming sages into their, into their homes, into their lives. This is, this is going to be a continuation of what Moses started or what God started with Moses on Sinai. And the relationship between God and Moses, between Moses and Joshua, between Joshua and the elders, between the elders and the prophets, between the prophets and the men of the great assembly, between men of the great assembly like Shimon at Sadiq and his followers like Antigonus of Soho, between Antigonus of Soho and his followers, Yosei ben Yuezer of Zreda and Yosei ben Yochanan of Jerusalem, is replicative. It replicates the original relationship between God and Moses. Right. If you follow the structure and the logic of the first four chapters of Pirkei Avot, I think that's the picture that emerges, that what rabbis do with their disciples is an imitation of or an echo of what happened in primordial time at the top of Mount Sinai between God and Moses. So you become the custodian of the revelation and you as the rabbi must transmit it to a willing disciple who is going to be like your Moses, your God, their Moses, and they will then be Moses to their Joshua's. Does that make sense? How how this works, Judy uh, Gross, your um, hand. And it speaks of the uh, into your homes. Whose homes is this? The homes of the disciple, because it almost there's a holiness that enters if sages enter, and you're studying together and drinking in the knowledge. Is it? Whose homes are we in? Yeah, presumably uh, this is, uh, again, anyone who is on the path to the rabbinate. So it's the, rab the rabbis. It's the rabbis in training or the, or the, you know, I don't even know if you can call them rabbis yet because the, I mean, clearly this is written by rabbis. So the rabbis of, of let's say, Yehuda Hanasi's time. Remember, Yehuda Hanasi is the last group from the last generation of sages. He is the one who's credited with being the final redactor of the Mishnah itself. So 230, 235 of the common era. But he's talking about a class of sages who are pre-rabbis who lived somewhere between the Maccabean uprising in 167 
and the fall of the temple in the year 70. That's a span of you know, the better part of 100, uh, 237 years, if I'm not mistaken. So the better part of 250 years. They are retrojecting. So the final compilers and redactors of the Mishnah are retrojecting onto their predecessors, the proto-rabbis, an understanding that comes to them from their own rabbinates, right? They are presuming, they are retrojecting back onto their predecessors the discipline of study and teaching that they themselves practice, live by, and want to teach to their disciples. Does that make sense? In other words, I'm not sure there's evidence that this one-to-one -one chain of transmission is historically verifiable. But the rabbis want to account for their own authority as the representatives of this Jewish tradition. And so what they're trying to do is make it clear that this was not just done in a willy-nilly way. There were disciples who deliberately cultivated, uh, sorry, sages who cul cultivated disciples Disciples welcomed sages into their home, and that was what made for the transmission of the Jewish tradition from one to the next to the next to the next. In You even hear this today when the rabbi, for instance, on the bima is celebrating a kid's bar mitzvah, and it's almost reflexive for us rabbis. We'll say something like, um, you know, Sophie, you are part of an unbroken chain of tradition. Well, what does that mean, right? Like, and uh, well, we actually have a visual for that. Is it true? Is it historically true? Probably not. I would say the chain of tradition is not an unbroken chain from one to the next to the next to the next with perfect fidelity being communicated down the generations, but rather something much more complicated. My own teacher, Rabbi Michael, uh, Dr. Michael Meyer, who was a scholar in residence at WRT many years ago, about 15, 16 years ago, said, you should not speak of Jewish tradition as a chain because what happens when you are holding a chain and one link breaks? The, the whole thing collapses, right? The chain literally disintegrates because a chain is one link to the next, to the next, to the next, which seems to be more or less what the rabbis are proposing here, a chain of tradition. Even in, uh, even in modern day uh, Hebrew, we refer to something called shalshelet hakabalah, which literally means the chain of tradition, a shalshelet is the Hebrew word for a chain. Dr. Meyer proposed to us when we were rabbinical students that we should always refer to Jewish tradition as a rope. It's the rope of Jewish tradition. And I've used this metaphor. How is a rope different from a chain? Well, a rope holds fast because it is made up of innumerable threads. Some are long, some are short, and they're all kind of twisted and tied up together. And if one fiber in a rope breaks, the integrity of the whole is not lost. Right, the rope doesn't disintegrate. The rope only disintegrates when all of its fibers disintegrate. Even then, you can have a rope hanging by a thread, right? If most of its fibers disintegrate, think about the Holocaust. How many strands in the rope of Jewish tradition were destroyed during the Holocaust, and yet the rope holds fast? We still, we're still here, despite the devastation. I think it's a much more accurate metaphor. It's just not the one the rabbis favor here. The rabbis here favor the chain because they want to talk about themselves as direct receptacles or conduits for the wisdom of their predecessors. How does that compute? Does that all kind of make sense now? Um, the only other thing I'll do is respond to a question that Bill Shore asked in the chat window, which is, uh, can you explain the word fear in the previous text? Does it mean to be afraid, and if so, of what? This is one of those great words in Jewish tradition. So the Hebrew word here is mora. Um, and maybe, just maybe, the rabbis were making a pun because the word mora is similar to more, or mora, which means a teacher. Um, and after all, the, the theme of all of these texts is about teaching. Um, the word fear is probably more like our English word awe. It's fear in the sense of reverence or veneration. It's that kind of fear. It's not, um, it's not the word in Hebrew pachad, which generally means like, I think there's a monster in my closet kind of fear, watching a horror movie kind of fear. 
um, fearing that something bad is going to happen to you. It's more standing in awe of God um, that, you know, you should feel overwhelmingly compelled to engage in a life of study because you are always standing in awe of God. And what God wants from you is to be a conduit of Torah. So that, I think, Bill, it's a well-taken question. I've never, you know, look, we do use the word fear in the sense of God-fearing. And I think that God-fearing, which is, by the way, I don't even think it's properly hyphenated. I think it's an actual word. And it seems to suggest to me that we have a particular valence for this kind of fear, even in the English language. We use God-fearing generally as a positive attribute. And I think if I describe a colleague, for instance, I say, oh, she's a God-fearing woman you would generally have a positive association. You would hear God-fearing and you probably wouldn't even process the word fear so much as you would think piety. Hand up from my dad. I think I put it in the comment section, Great. but anyway, there, there's no indication here about anything that the students are supposed to add to the discussion or to the, to the basis of knowledge. That right. was to me to be the essential academic quest is to make the students even greater than the teachers. We'll get there. Okay. We'll learn about the students, but you're right. That's not where this text begins. Um, I liken this text, by the way, to my relationship with one of my, with a few of the people I have been privileged to call my rabbis in my life. Um, in some cases, it has been much more of a reciprocal relationship, an openly reciprocal relationship. But when it comes to one rabbi in particular, and that would be Rabbi Rick Jacobs, I would say that my relationship with Rick, at least for the first several years, was much more like the one that is being recommended here, at my best. <laughs> at my best, I would kind of just hang out with Rick, watch what he did, listen to how he spoke, and learn from him that way. Rick is not, when it comes to how he mentors his own disciples, and I think discipleship has been a very important part of Rabbi Jacob's career, at least the, t the 29 years that he spent in congregational life. I think that he really took very seriously the uh, role of mentoring younger colleagues. And, you know, if you look at some of the people who started off as Rick Jacob's assistant rabbis, um, they've gone on to be leaders in the reform movement. I include them, I include among them Rabbi uh, Beth Singer, Rabbi Judy Schindler, Rabbi Ken Chasen, Rabbi Angela Bookdahl. Um, I came along and was privileged to be one of Rick's disciples. But the way in Rick, the way in which Rick tends to mentor, he would never say like, you know, John, I wish you would have done this differently, or let's unpack this together. It was much more watch and learn. You learned a lot from Rick just by paying attention to his rabbinate. So the first obligation of the student is to sit in the dust of the feet of the master and just take it all in. Drink their words with thirst. The obligation is on the student, not the teacher. And that's really interesting too. I just think for, as, a, as a pedagogue myself, as a person who thinks a lot about education, I wonder if we fail when we put all of the responsibility for teaching on the teachers. I wonder if we could do more to help young people and their families become more practiced at the art of learning? It's an interesting inversion of the question, and, and I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm more off the cuff than anything else. Joe or Barbara, did you wish to make a comment since you are uh, unmuted? If, if you can go back to your screen with the text. I certainly can. Thank you. Go for it. Um, I'm on uh, the second line. Um, uh, da, da, da. Uh, you're, no, the one one above one. Yeah, um, wait, what? You can too fast. Right. Uh, yeah, the the one where it says no. Nope, the next one. Um, don't go into. Uh, don't listen to a woman. Oh, we um, haven't gotten there yet. Oh, okay. Hang on. Hold tight. We're getting. We're getting there. Um, Joe, did you have a comment? Okay. Let's no, it was mentioned already about the word fear. Good. As you you use it in ter in 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 interrelationship with reverence, which I thought was a, a better description of that word moral. Right. It's the same root, by the way. Not more but, of the, uh... 
I think I follow what you're saying, Joe. Um, it's the same root as when we refer to the days of awe in Hebrew by their name, Yamim no Ra'im. It's the same root, no Ra'im. We don't generally say days of fear. I mean, I guess they are, <laughs> especially if you're, if you're Jewish. The 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are not like easy breezy. Um, but days my, of my awe is better than days of fear, I think. My, my internal question with that was, why do we have to fear heaven if we live Torah, if we live the right way, there's nothing to fear? Again, I think it's, I think the rabbis are very attuned to this dialectic between love and fear as motivators of human behavior, right? Most of the things we do in our lives, we do either out of love or fear. Um, and by the way, some of us tend to be driven more by our positive passions, and some of us tend to be driven more by our negative anxieties. But one, uh, there's, some, there's some deep psychological, rever uh, uh, I think, insight here to the way in which both love and fear are powerful motivators of behavior. So if what the rabbis are doing here in this text is trying to inculcate behavior, think of them uh, through a psychological lens. Think about what would be powerful modalities for rabbis to communicate to their students the importance of study, or not just the importance, like the, the qualities that should motivate their study. And I think they want to make room for, it should be a little bit of both, right? Love on the one hand should motivate you to study Torah. And there are plenty of people at Westchester Reform Temple whose love of Torah is their primary motivation. And then there are the people whose Jewish connection, maybe not their love of Torah, but their Jewish connection is mostly out of fear. If I don't show up for the high holidays this year, God forbid I won't be written in the book of life. I think I better show up for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm oversimplifying. Um, yes, I'm with you, Joe, that in the ideal world, love would be a sufficient motivator, but it isn't. Plain and simple. It's just not. You know, the people who love staying connected to Judaism are, you know, probably 10, 20% of the Jewish people in my anecdotal experience. And the people who are motivated to stay connected to Judaism because they're afraid that if they don't, they are dishonoring their grandparents or they are failing their children somehow. Um, I mean, I even hear this all the time. The main reason you have to go to Hebrew school is because I went to Hebrew school. I hated it. So will you. It's what we do. <laughs> it's negative motivation, right? Not, not, I did this because I loved it. You know, it was so meaningful to me. I, I literally hear this right now. You have to do this. You're going to hate it. It's going to be miserable, but you have to do it because otherwise grandma of blessed memory will be rolling over in her grave. <laughs> okay, Judy. This, this is, oh, by the way, this is not a digression, because these texts are really all about why be Jewish. And if you really want to look at Pirkei Avot as a kind of like, what's the bigger theme here? Take it as a, a text, a master text in why be Jewish. Judy Gross, your comment. It's just another example of translation. My translation said awe. And I think it's interesting because if you said the word awe, this entire conversation about fear would not have ensued. It's, yes. It's, Translation is very interesting. Yeah, it is. And translation is powerful. Translation is interpretation. Karen Levin. You just have to unmute yourself. Yeah, oh, I was, I'm trying to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. I just wanted to bring up an element uh, that hasn't been totally lifted up in the sitting at the dust of your feet and bringing everybody in to the discussion is that there's a lot of learning going on and it's not only top down. That the students, we always have a lot to learn from students. And I think that kind of engagement uh, enhances the learning. Thank you. Um, I learned a powerful, I learned a powerful rabbinic teaching from another person I call my rabbi and that's Rabbi Jan Katsu. Um, Many of you know Jan. Uh, he was a member of WRT for many years, participated regularly in Torah study, taught classes at WRT, including some that he co-taught with me. Um, he's now a professor of Jewish education and service learning at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. Um, Jan is really one of the very small handful of other people in my life that I call my rabbi. And in fact, I have a regular study practice with Rabbi Katsu. 
And during sabbatical, I intend to be studying with him uh, weekly, which is wonderful. I'm studying with him now, it's more like monthly, um, sometimes a little bit more frequently, but we try to carve out time, uh, but it's gonna, it's gonna uh, increase. Uh, many, many years ago, I was relating to Jan some experience I had in my confirmation class with my 10th graders. And he told such a powerful story about his daughter, Kara, when she was in confirmation class. Now, both of Jan's cat, Jan and Lainey Katsu's kids are adopted. Um, they adopted Sarit in infancy and then Kara. Um, and Kara's, uh, Kara made some comment in class one night about, um, she corrected the teacher who happened to be my predecessor, Rabbi Ken Chasen. And she said something to the effect of, well, you know, not every child is born to her parents. Some are adopted. And she just spoke from a place of truth from her heart. And Rabbi Katsu, Jan related to me what Ken Rabbi Chasen said next to her um, has remained with him. And I think he wanted to share it with me by way of my discipleship. He said, in that moment, Rabbi Chasen stopped what he was doing, looked her in the eye and said, thank you for being my teacher. Um, and it's, it's just one of the best lines ever. Um, and I, it, it echoes powerfully, uh, Karen, your comment, that of course, in, in the best circumstances, um, the rabbi is not only teacher, but also learner from and with one's students. So, um, so Karen, thank you for being my teacher. Um, and we're back into the text. Here we go. Um, all right, this one's not too hard. And what I would love for is a volunteer to read it. Maybe somebody who hasn't yet spoken today. Um, it's not hard. I'll give you the hard part is Yossi ben Yochanan. The rest is easy. Um, so somebody, uh, a brave reader, would you kindly read Yossi ben Yochanan? All right, Barbara, you're the one who wanted to talk about this. So I'm going to put you up to it. Can you unmute yourself, please? This offer will expire in five seconds. Yossi <laughs> ben Yochanan, a man of Jerusalem, used to say, let thy house be wide open and let the poor be members of thy household. Engage not in too much conversation with women. They, they said this with regard to one's own wife. How much more does the rule apply with regard to another man's wife? From here, the sages said, as long as a man engages in too much conversation with women, he causes evil to himself. He neglects the study of Torah, and in the end, he will inherit Gehenoma. Yeah, in the end, he's going to go to hell. Okay, um, <laughs> we were kind of like coasting along today until we hit this Mishnah. Uh, <laughs> here's, where, here's where I have to invite you lovingly and gently to suspend your impulse to judge, just do kind of like meditate and say to yourself, I feel negative judgment arising within me and then try to dispel it. That's a great practice, by the way, before you blurt out something you might later regret. Obviously the targets of your judgment are not here to defend themselves. Um, also the mores of first century BCE Jewish life are substantially different from the mores of our own Jewish lives in our liberal, that is to say, progressive reform Jewish community here in Scarsdale or Westchester. So let's talk about these people. Yossi ben Yochanan, you notice this is the first time Mishnah 5 deviates from the pattern. It doesn't say that he received this tradition from a predecessor, from a teacher. That leads me to conjecture, hmm, where did he get this? Maybe this is just Yossi ben Yochanan's own bugaboo. Maybe he got caught in a compromising position with one of his friend's wives. I don't know. Um, so I don't know where he gets this, but he's one of many sages who wants to share his wisdom. And the first thing he says sounds very nice. And you notice that, you know, the flow here adheres to a certain internal logic. Let thy house be wide open. Well, that echoes almost exactly what we heard in the text before. Um, it says, Vihi vetecha, I'm looking up here in the previous text, let your house, Yehi betcha, your bayit, bait or vet va'ad lachachamim. Let your house be a house of meeting for the sages. Here, the line is, Yehi vetecha, so it's the same formulation, let your house be. Patuach lirvacha, 
open wide, wide open. Vihiyu aniyim b'nevetecha, and let the poor become like members of your own household. Let them be like your own kids, so to speak. Ve'al tarbe sicha im ha'isha, but do not engage in much conversation with a woman. Um, and it actually says with a woman singular, not with women plural. So don't overdo it in terms of having conversations with women. So uh, let's break this down into, uh, into its constituent parts. And again, it's a threefold uh, maxim. Right. First, let your house be wide open. Second, let the poor be like members of your household. And thirdly, don't talk to women. Okay. Um, other than the fact that it's a threefold thing, do these ideas connect? What is the? Uh, what do you think the the issue is here, specifically with regard to his caution around speaking to women? He tells you, by the way, this is not a this is not a trick question. He gives you the answer at the end of the text. So it's it's a question about a matter of time. He doesn't want people to waste their time not studying. Right. And and the issue is that in in, in days of old, women did not study. So exactly. if he's going to engage in conversation with an unlearned person, it's a waste of his time. Good. Thank you for expressing that without without an abundance of judgment of negative judgment. Um, uh, look, I. This doesn't mean that we would adopt the same standard today, but there's a certain logic to this. If women are not participants in any way, really, certainly not full participants in the study of Torah, then this is simply a matter of giving priority to studying Torah, because any conversation that isn't about Torah is not uh, as worthy as a conversation that is about Torah. Um, so that's the first piece, I think, of this. Um, what other assumptions uh, do you find in this text, uh, particularly about the role of women in society? I mean, is there more in other words? Is it merely that women don't participate in Torah study and therefore a conversation with a woman is a distraction from the study of Torah? I think that's the plainest uh, sense of the text. Do you see anything else in here that might lead you to further conclusions about the text. And by you translated Isha as woman, but isn't Isha his wife? Well, that's interesting. Isha means both a woman and it also means the wife. Right. Yeah, so yes, I would say once again, we find that in the Hebrew, the text is somewhat more ambiguous than any one translation provides. So I believe that it's a legitimate and maybe even preferable translation, Barbara, along the lines that you're thinking. Don't engage in much conversation with the wife, let alone another man's wife. Well, would it be it's, Nashim for a woman? Wouldn't well, no, Nashim? Nashim would be women in general. Women in general. Right, so they said this, and then he clarifies this. They said this, Be'ishto Amru. He was referring to his wife. Kalva Homer. We're going to talk about this formulation in a minute. Uh, here they translate it as how much the more, Kalva Homer, does the rule apply to Eshet Chavero with his friend's wife? Not, not only another man's wife, but one of his friend's wives. I think you can, I think now you can, now I've given you enough reason not to, I've, I've, I've scared you off from saying something that you're afraid is going to be perceived as a negative judgment, but I'd like you to just say it. I mean, what, what do you think some of the assumptions about wives and women are in this text. Just name it. Russell, comment. It seems to be- It's saying that women are contaminated. Uh, the, uh, and it's not, and I, I, and you know, I never disagree with Alan, but I think it's not simply a matter of time uh, because I, we no longer have the text on the screen. But it doesn't simply say, if you engage in conversation with women, you will neglect the, the uh, you will neglect the Tor study of Torah. It says first, he causes evil to himself. And so it is not simply a matter of time. He's, women are contaminated and you, the male, will be contaminated if you have too much commerce with her. And it also assumes that every relationship with a woman ultimately is sexual, right. because that's why you must be especially wary of engaging in any 
commerce with another man's wife. Outstanding. So thank you for that. And I, and I deliberately put in all of those disclaimers up front so that wouldn't be the first and only thing you would see because I felt that it would blind you to the other dimensions of the text. Um, that this is still based on a presumption that women, a conversation with a woman is never going to be a conversation about Torah matters because women were not obligated to study or learn Torah. And in fact, they were actively discouraged. And by the way, this model persists in the Haredi world today, right? Where it is not only considered, um, you know, not the domain of women to engage in Torah, but it is uh, rather something more forceful than that. It is that women who engage in Torah I believe are seen, at least in the ultra ultra orthodox communities with which I am familiar, as a contaminant in that environment. And that women by their very nature serve only in sanctified context to distract men or lure men, right. seduce men sexually away from the purity of their study of Torah. What a devaluation of women. Correct. I mean, it's, it's a, it is a classic demonstration of rabbinic misogyny. And there's no way around that. And, I, and I, you have to pay attention to, it's not just what he says, it's how he says it, right? So good on Russell for observing that. It's not just that this is a distraction from Torah. There's, this takes away nothing from the accuracy of Alan's read, by the way. And, and these coexist, in other words. But it further goes on to say this will cause evil, Ra'a is the word, misfortune. A man will fall into misfortune and he's ultimately on a road to hell. <laughs> that, is not, that is not a delicate way of describing the peril of engaging in conversation with another man's wife or even one's own wife. But look Did he where... have a mother or a sister? Sorry, there are a few people talking at once. So let me, let me hear from uh, my dad who's got a hand up. But I think what's being missed here is the fact that it's not blaming the women in this section. It is putting all the onus on the men for their own behavior. Correct. And that, I think, is what gets misinterpreted by the Haredi, because they seem to suggest that, oh my gosh, if I sat next to a woman, I would be overcome with sexual impropriety. It's all the woman's fault. That's Correct. why we have to keep them separate because we poor weak men cannot protect ourselves from their, from their feminine wiles. Well, and now the judgment's the really coming thing. out, but. <laughs> but there's no, that's nowhere in this text. Right. That, it's this is it this is. is where my dad gets to play the part of my id. <laughs> so the, the kind of unfiltered judgment, which is, by the way, I think warranted. Right. So just a, a, a complimentary anecdote, complimentary with an E, not an I. I don't think it compliments anyone. But uh, three years ago, Cantor Kleiman and I had just completed a successful uh, leadership of a trip to Israel with 24 12th graders from WRT. Uh, please God, we'll be able to do that again, probably not this February, but you never know, maybe not before all that long. Um, and we were seated uh, on an El Al plane in adjacent rows and Cantor Kleinman was approached by, um, or uh, a, a flight attendant who informed her uh, that the gentleman who had been seated next to her was asking her to move 10 rows back because he did not want to be seated next to a woman and could a nice Orthodox man be moved up, you know, somebody he knew from 10 rows back should be sitting next to him instead. Um, we politely declined that invitation. We said, sorry, you can arrange to move somewhere else if you are uncomfortable sitting next to it. But it's exactly that dynamic that the, I believe that it misrepresents the Jewish tradition to put the onus or the blame on the woman. Um, and this text is an indication that this is in what the, it is the man or the men who are being adjured. Plain and simple. You don't like it. You can move somewhere else. You can do what you need to do to avoid temptation, but stop blaming women for being inveterate seductresses. Um, Bill Shore, hand up, please comment. Uh, back to my question about fear. This one seems to really be talking about fear 
in, in our usual meaning of being afraid as opposed to being in awe. Can you comment about um, how much of these teachings or how we should be looking at doing things because of fear of punishment? I think that I think that you are attuned to the inner workings of the text and the tradition here. Uh, look, I'm I you know my only caution here is when I comment about orthodox practice or traditional Jewish practice, I do so as an outsider looking in and not as an insider looking in or an insider looking out. And so I want to be very cautious because I think there's a lot of ill-informed or insufficiently informed judgment, usually negative judgment of our Orthodox co-religionists. Also um, muddied by the fact that too many of us, self-included, tend to lump Orthodox Jews into the same bucket when in fact the truth is really far from that representation. Um, so to the extent though that some of my perception of Orthodox life conforms to your impression, Bill, that there seems to be a, a valence in these texts that suggests that you kind of always have to look out for God over your shoulder, right? It's like that Shalom Auslander book. We read Shalom Auslander a number of weeks ago, uh, who wrote that charming and disturbing story about the blessing bee. If you read that whole story, it's very clear that his Jewish upbringing, his Jewish milieu of strict orthodoxy was motivated by fear, particularly the punishment that would await. You have to read the story to get this. It will sound completely bonkers and crass if I just say it, which I will. Um, but go back and read Blessing B for the punishment that awaits a young boy who indulges in masturbation. The rabbis, Shalom Auslander says that his rabbis growing up taught them, these boys in his cheder, in his yeshiva, that if they masturbated, that someday they would be punished in Gehenna in a boiling vat of all of the semen they had wasted. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> so I, yeah, to the extent that then as now, behavior is motivated through fear in traditional Jewish contexts, I think is an accurate, if incomplete representation of the full picture. And I see it here in texts like this as well. There's definitely a beware of God. I call it the God of uh, Santa Claus is coming to town. You better watch out. Uh, wait, 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 you better not, I don't know, pout, thank you. You better not pout. You better not. I don't know. I'm not Christian. <laughs> um, you better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. And then the, the bridge of the song is awful. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. That part I know. That's horrifying. What kind of a Santa, like that's Santa Claus as like evil, you know, uh, dibbuk in your house. I don't know. It's just, it's the weirdest portrayal of St. Nick. He sees you when you're sleeping? Oh my God. <laughs> so anyway, who came up with this? Where does that fit into the Santa Claus mythology? I don't know, but I guess you wanna motivate your kids, especially on Christmas Eve to shut up and go to bed or they won't get presents because Santa Claus sees you when you're sleeping. So there is something about the God of Santa Claus is coming to town being uh, uh, one of the ways in which I understand these texts portraying one's relationship to God and punishment. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a fear factor here. Absolutely. Adati, did you want to chime in with any further thought or comment on your earlier remark? Oh, um, it made me think that the stage in quotation marks never had a mother or a daughter or a sister. The only woman he knew was his evil wife. <laughs> well, I don't know because I can't, you know, I can't give a full psychology to this particular or that particular sage. Um, I think it's more culturally informed than familially informed. Let's, you know, you have to presume that the domain to which women were relegated was the, the world of, you know, the, the, the domestic. 
Um, and women were instrumental in the household, but they were not considered worthy of the inheritance of Torah. Um, and so it, I think it's fair both to say, on the one hand, just from a logic standpoint, women don't engage in Torah. Therefore, any time you spend in conversation with a woman is time that could have better been spent studying Torah. Um, but I, I also think that you have to take in the full array of Jewish text and teaching that venerates the place of the woman in the household. Um, so I, I, I don't, I'm not going to make a, you know, an apology for the text. I'll simply try to affirm what Dottie is seeing and the consternation it may cause in you or in any of us, and also round it out by saying, well, th there are probably other nuances here because it's also clear that a husband's obligation to his own wife is somewhat more uh, rounded and informed by the obligation to care for, to be compassionate toward, to furnish for, to and to give significant or to permit significant authority in the domestic sphere. So, okay, we read on from here. Thank you for working through all of your uh, deep feelings and uh, challenges around this text. They are well noted and I think uh, important to lift up as we proceed. Um, now we're back to, this is interesting. It's almost like we've resumed the flow. And there's something about this text and just the way it's shaped. Yossi ben Yochanan, a man of Jerusalem used to say, we still don't know much about this guy. And unlike the previous texts and unlike the text that we're gonna look at now, he is not given a direct place in this chain of tradition about which I've been speaking at quite some length today. So now we're back to somebody who's part of the chain of tradition. And the question is, is this Yehoshua ben Parachia and Mitai the Arbalite? When it says it re they received the oral tradition from them, there's a tell here. There's a hint. <laughs> Who are the them? Another guy. I think you've got to go two up. The, we're back to these guys again. And the reason I say that is because it's a plural them. And there's no seeming connection to Yossi ben Yochanan from Jerusalem. And I just wonder aloud here, and this is my conjecture, this isn't something I got from somewhere else. But as I read this, trying to read every word as significant, if the, if the pronoun is them, Hoshua ben Parachia and Nitai the Arbalite received the oral tradition from them. It must refer to a plural or a couple. Um, Yossi ben Yoazer of Zreda and Yossi ben Yochanan of Yerushalayim. Then you have this outlying text, which by the way, perhaps not coincidentally, happens to be the one text that really gave us some trouble today. Not, not intellectually perhaps, but um, emotionally. Now we're back to receiving uh, another pair, receiving them from them. And I just want receiving the tradition from them, plural. And I just wonder if we are being guided deliberately to see this guy, Yossi ben Yochanan, as an outlier to the tradition. Here's my logic. Notice that starting in uh, this text here, we are introduced to a pair of scholars, Yossi ben Yoazer, and Yossi ben Yochanan, they together received the tradition from their predecessor, Shimon the Righteous. Then you have the person I'm thinking of as an outlier, Yossi ben Yochanan of Jerusalem with the troubling text about women. Now we're back to a pair, Yossi ben Parachia and Nitai the Arbalite who received the oral tradition from them. And I just wonder if that's the rabbi's way of distancing the chain of tradition from this particular inclusion. Now you might ask, but so why did they include it at all? Usually the answer to why include a troubling text is because it was popular or known or accepted, or they couldn't have removed it or they would have been accused of censorship. In other words, why include something that's so disturbing? Perhaps because everybody knew it. It was a well-known teaching and you kind of were forced to include it. But the way in which the rabbis uh, both include it and distance, them, distance themselves from it is by not giving Yossi ben Yochanan a clear place in this direct chain of transmission. 
I could be way out on a limb here. I'm just, and maybe you could say, Blake, I think you're overreading it. But I would like to propose that a close reading invites us to consider that dynamic. That's all I'll I'll say about that. Um, so let's let's read about our friend Yehoshua ben Parachia and his buddy Nitai the Arbalite. There's also something we said here about every anytime a pair is mentioned, that it reinforces the rabbinic norm that Torah is to be studied by pairs in pairs. We have a name for that. It's called Chavruta. And even today, it is the predominant way in which Judaism and Torah is learned in traditional yeshiva settings and even at WRT. Uh, were we in person, we might be doing a little bit more chavruta. If I had the wherewithal and thought it would be beneficial, I could do breakout rooms where you'd be paired up with a number of member of the class. It's one important way of studying Torah. I have a chavruta. My chavruta, I just told you, is Rabbi Jan Katsu. And we call ourselves chavruta, by the way. I mean, Rabbi Katsu will say, when are we meeting as chav or for chavruta? Um, when are we meeting as a pair to study Torah? Um, Okay, uh, a new reader, somebody who maybe hasn't spoken yet, but who would like to read Yehoshua ben Parachia, Joshua ben Parachia, and Nitai the Arbalite. I've given you the hard parts. Um, somebody raised a hand. Go ahead, unmute yourself. You're on. Yeah. Me. Great. Joshua ben Parachia and Nitai the Arbalite received the oral tradition from them. Joshua ben Parahaya used to say, appoint for thyself a teacher and acquire for thyself a companion and judge and judge all the men, judge all men with the scale weighted in his favor. Great. It's not a great translation. So um, let's unpack it. Yehoshua ben Parahia, literally Joshua, son of a guy named Parahia, which literally means the flower of God. A perach is a flower or a blossom. So God's blossom. Uh, Joshua ben Parachia and Nitai Ha'arbeli, Nitai the Arbalite. I don't know what an Arbalite is, but Nitai was one of them. Kiblu Mehem. They received the tradition from them. I am proposing that's Yossi ben uh, Tzereda, Yossi of Tzereda, and Yossi, Yossi ben Yoezer of Tzereda, and Yossi ben Yochanan of Jerusalem. Those two, previous, up two texts. So next in the chain is Joshua and Nitai. Joshua used to say, and notice, by the way, that in these pairs, only one of them has a text associated with him, right? You have up here, Yossi ben Yoezer and Sereda, uh, of Sereda and Yossi ben Yochanan of Jerusalem, but only Yossi ben Yoezer is credited with the saying. So clearly it's a chavruta, I'm assuming, where one was the more senior partner or the more learned or the more venerated, and he is the one to whom the text or teaching is attributed. Just notice that continues here. Joshua and Nittai, but only Joshua gets credited for saying, appoint for thyself a teacher and acquire for thyself a companion and judge all men with the scale weighted in his favor. I do not like this translation. Judy Gross, what does your translation say? Uh, unmute yourself kindly. Uh, make as you know, Yahashua ben Prakia uh, says, make a teacher for yourself, acquire a friend for yourself, and judge everyone favorably. Wonderful. And my translation says, get yourself a teacher, acquire a companion, and give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Which is the which is actually the translation that I think is the most idiomatically uh, satisfying. Uh, so. You may have heard this teaching before. Again, it's threefold wisdom. So the format is identical to the pattern. We're seeing that this is a mnemonic in threes that the disciple was expected to be, uh, ex was expected to memorize. Get thyself a teacher, get yourself a teacher, acquire for yourself a companion, and dan et kol ha'adam lechaf zechut. I love this phrase. Uh, so just unpacking it and literally judge your fellow man or person, judge your fellow, lechaf zechut. I would say with the benefit of the doubt, or here they say with the scale weighted in his favor, assume the best of every person. So what are the rabbis proposing here and how do these three ideas link up with one another? Get yourself a teacher, 
acquire yourself a companion and judge everybody else favorably or give other people the benefit of the doubt. What, I mean, this is a famous teaching, but I, I would like to ask the question, why? What makes this teaching, uh, why is this such a celebrated teaching? What, what are we supposed to derive from it? Or even what questions do you have of the text? Because I don't think that, I think that this conceals layers of meaning that we may not uh, see immediately on the surface. It's not obvious how the third goes with the first two. Great. Not obvious. So let's just hold that. Let's hold that not obviousness and our, you know, kind of wrestle a little bit with that as we try to tease out what might be the thread that links them, if anything. Get yourself a teacher, acquire yourself a companion. And what and let's just let's start with the first two, because I think they're a little bit more obvious. Um, what's the difference? What's the same? What are the rabbis? What are the rabbis doing here? What, how does this connect to the bigger rabbinic project? May, may I make a suggestion? Would you please? Yes. Um, the first two begin with a statement of humility. It requires you to acknowledge that you need a teacher and that you need a companion. Uh, and on top of that, it's telling you to take responsibility for your own upliftment, whether it is uh, your, the, your uh, enlightenment or whether it's your place in the world. And so therefore, in, if, if you approach those two things, your, as I say, your internal life and your outward life, with that sense of humility and the sense that you are responsible for taking action, that would require you to, to assume that others are, are, are doing the same, not blaming other people for what uh, enlightenment has not come to you for your solitude or for your disconnection. Lovely, lovely. I think wonderful insights, um, a, a lot to uh, explore uh, in there. I think that one of the connecting ideas is indeed the theme of humility, which is required in all three of these uh, aphorisms or these three instructions. To acquire a teacher does first uh, require that one is humble enough to accept that one needs a teacher. Notice again, by the way, that the frame of reference, remember this is a book by rabbis for their disciples. Notice that the obligation rests upon the disciple and not the rabbi. It is not the teacher's job to encircle himself, it would always be him, with students. It is rather the student's job to seek out and acquire first and foremost a teacher, somebody before whom you debase yourself and say, fill me with your knowledge. Let me drink the words that you speak. Let me sit and get dirty in the dust of your feet. All of these, by the way, connect with the text above. Um, and that's another reason why I see a spiritual lineage between Joshua and Nittai. When it says it, they received it from them, I'm going to skip over Yossi ben Yochanan, this out, I'm calling him the outlier, and go back to Yossi ben Yoezer, of Tzereda and Yossi ben Yochanan of Jerusalem, who are talking about opening your home up to the rabbis, the sages, sitting in the dust of their feet and drinking in their words with thirst. These are all acts that similarly to how Russell frames one of the connecting threads in our text right now, chapter uh, Mishnah 6, all require humility, really a debasement of the self so that you are receptacle for the teachings of the master yeah. or the masters. Um, Judy, comment. This is all about the beauty of learning. It's and it's, it's very positively, get yourself a teacher. We have our teacher. He's sitting in front of all of us and, and teaching us. Get the teacher and, and have a haruta, have another person. Don't study alone. You need to study with others and judge everyone favorably. Listen, be open. Love that. Don't nurture. Uh, opinions and and say this is the way it's all but be open to others and learn it's 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 the perfect environment for learning 
Right. And don't assume that just because your friend, quote unquote, is an unlearned peer, just like you are, that he has nothing to offer you. Right. So it's really important. Look, I apply this quite directly. I have a lot of people. I'm very grateful for a congregation that values my teaching. Um, and I have received a number of compliments over the years thanking me for being a teacher. But less frequently do I hear people say, oh, but I, I really come not only to learn from the rabbi, but from my fellow classmates. And so maybe my charge to you between now and next week is to carry uh, from today's class something that you heard somebody besides the rabbi share that makes you feel grateful for the friendship of your peers and the added value of learning in a context with friends as opposed to only one-on-one -on -one with me. I will speak quite personally, viewing you not only as my students, but also as my, my peers and friends and, my, and therefore my teachers, that this maxim I think applies every time I sit down or stand up to teach. I want to go into a teaching, I think I'm my best as a teacher when I am not only telling you what I see in a text or what I have learned about, uh, you know, what my subject matter, but when I make myself uh, a very open vessel for receiving what I have learned from, what I can learn from the class. And that's, I think, the primary reason why I think I'm a better teacher today than I was when I was ordained 20 years ago. It's because of you. Um, I think that it took me some time and humility to grow into that, by the way. Uh, it, it, interestingly enough, when I was ordained a rabbi, I was much more persuaded that I knew more than my students than I do today. <laughs> I, think, I, think that, I think that being a rabbi can be a wonderful object lesson in cultivating humility. And I usually now go into a class saying, I don't know exactly what's going to come out of this class today. I have a few thoughts on what I want to teach, but I really, what I really want is to have an experience where by studying with you together, new meanings and insights will be uncovered. Honestly, that's what sustains me as your teacher, Judy. And you're a teacher too, Judy, so I'd love to hear you I'm speak. I'm sorry to keep talking, but this is one teaching technique that I think applies here. You have people who speak a lot. I'm, unfortunately, I'm one of them. But in a classroom, before you, when you call on a student and you're having a discussion, you ask the student, what did the previous person say? Oh, that's and cool. then say what you then give your your opinion but listen you listen to the other first repeat what that person said and then you can go on and give your statement beautiful listening is so crucial and thank you because i think that further underlines the value of the third of these statements judge all people favorably just assume that you know don't assume that what the person you privately think of as a blowhard or a know-it-all or ignorant, just try to excise those thoughts from your mind when you're in an environment where other people are sharing Torah with you. And that's the context for this comment. Yes, more broadly, having a teacher in your life, having friends, life is not something that is best experienced alone. There's something, so you can take this text, it, it works at multiple levels, I, but I think in its original context, as Pirkei Avot is the handbook for rabbis uh, training their disciples, um, then this is a really important text about how we study Torah and where we find meaning and value in the experience of studying Judaism together. Um, Russell and Dad, hands are up. I simply wanted to add what I hope is not a hackneyed uh, quotation from Chaucer, uh, who uh, in uh, made the stunning observation that teaching and learning are the same exercise, in which he describes the clerk of Oxford, and if I recall, he says that the source of his moral speech was that gladly would he learn and gladly teach. Beautiful. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that like uh, on a little uh, sticker that I can keep in front of me. It's beautiful, and uh, I was. Uh, a, a real Chaucer enthusiast in my college, my collegiate years. And, and, and since, I focused a lot on the, uh, the anti-Semitism in the Prioress's tale, um, which is mm -hmm. a, one of the many delights and challenges of reading Chaucer. Um, all right, Dad, you, you've got a hand up, and then I'm going to take us back for one final thought before we conclude. I think it's interesting that you identified me as your kid here, but 
if we're on that, I think the 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 most important part of those of those three things that go to you know that are put together is the third because there are examples of finding evil teachers and evil students. The point of this is to increase justice, not to not to uh, pervert the the uh, teacher student relationship, which you know. It, is a possibility. This is clearly putting uh, the, uh, the weight of the teacher-student uh, relationship on improving um, the world. Quite so. Yeah, quite so, lovely. Final thought, because I, I meant to come back to this. This is more of a technical thought. It's more of a coda to our study today because I think that we're in a lovely place to, to pause before we come back in two weeks time taking a week off for Thanksgiving and then seeing you on the first Thursday in December. Uh, I wanna just show you one uh, technical bit here. Um, in the troubling passage that we looked at, Mishnah 5, on the talking to women, I just wanna point out a, uh, a function of classical rabbinic hermeneutics. That's the uh, technical academic term that describes how uh, meaning is derived in a text or teaching. It comes from the Greek god Hermes, who was the one who shuttled between Mount Olympus, the domain of the gods, and the earthly realm. So Hermes was the messenger god in Greek mythology. And the word hermeneutics is named for Hermes because it performs the function of shuttling between a text or a teaching and the way in which people understand it. So hermeneutics is that discipline by which meaning is made, made plain in a text. Re the rabbis have their own discipline of hermeneutics. In other words, there are rules for how the rabbis find meaning in text and make meaning in text. And there are all sorts of, if you've ever studied Midrash, for instance, and I am and just a in a lifelong love affair with Midrash. Midrash plays by a certain set of rules. They may not be intuitively obvious to anyone who's a modern day reader of English, but they make sense in their own context. One rabbinic hermeneutic, one principle of making meaning in rabbinic discourse is something known as kal vachomer. Uh, I'll circle the words with my mouse here. So you see where I'm floating my cursor over these two words here, kal Vachomer. Literally, these words mean light and heavy. Kal is the Hebrew word for light, not in the sense of uh, shining light, but light. Uh, my briefcase is light today because I didn't put my laptop in it. And homer, which means heavy. And the hermeneutic here is called an argument from the light to the heavy. You see this all the time. And I, and I anticipate that what, I, sorry, I'm trying to just stop my screen share for five seconds here, but I lost my, I lost my ability to do that. Well, that's troubling. Give me just a half a second. I'm sorry. I can't find where it says, oh, there it is. Stop share. Um, so the, the discipline of from the light to the heavy um, is that it um, begins with an if-then proposition. If X is true, where X is the light, then how much the more so is Y true, where Y is a kind of emphasizer of X. So the way in which it functions, it, it's hard to do this in the theoretical, I'll do it in the applicable. If it is bad to have discourse with your own wife, how much the more so with another man's wife? right? Because at least you have a relationship with your wife that is intimate and guarded. With another man's wife, all of the protections are removed. The temptation to sin is all the greater. So I just wanted to point that out as a kind of hermeneutic of rabbinic discourse that will come up again and again. You will, you will see how this happens, that uh, time and time again, the rabbis will uh, use kalva homer. They will say, if such and so is true here, how much the more so there, given that the second condition is a, a quantitative or qualitative increase of condition number one. 
And that's where I wanted to end our conversation today with <coughs> your ability to get in the last word, comment, thought, or what have you. Somebody wrote, um, uh, Hermes has a big part in the play Hades Town. Does indeed. He's the, basically the narrator for the show. And thank you, Steve, for telling us that Fred Coots and Haven Gillespie wrote Santa Claus is Coming to Town. I'm going to have to look up what the hell they were thinking. <laughs> Santa Claus is Coming to Town is the most terrifying Christmas carol of all time. Just, just keep that in mind. If you learned nothing else from the rabbi today, mm -hmm. I know you learned from one another, but if you learned nothing else from the rabbi today, it's that I gave you a new reason to go back and look at Santa Claus is Coming to Town and be terrified. And on that Eddie note- made that, Eddie Cantor made that song famous. Really? Nice Jewish boy. Um, well, they, all, they also have the Lord's Prayer, which says, and if I die before I wake. So, <laughs> but, but then again, so does Adon Olam. The last mm -hmm. verse of Adon Olam is, um, um, I praise you, God, uh, when I lie down and when I wake. And if my soul is taken before I arise, still I will praise God. That's, that's uh, Adon I leave Eloi Ra, and I have no fear. That's it. speaking of fear, the last stanza of Adon Olam is the whole, the same idea. If I die before I wake. Okay, my friends, I hope you have a joyful, healthy, safe above all Thanksgiving. Um, eat and drink, be merry, be grateful, and be grateful that we get a week off, but we'll be right back at it in two weeks time. And I look forward to staying in touch between now and then. I'll wish you all very well. Happy oh, Keith. Well. Thanks, everyone. Bye, John. Stay well. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Good to see you. Thank you.